Welcome to a new episode on the Technomora channel. We really hope you will enjoy watching it and invite you to tell us what you think of it by leaving your reactions below the video. And now, please allow me to present your host, Technomora. Why, thank you, Julie. So now let's jump right into the new episode. All right. I released four Phillips screws, wood screws, from the back of the speaker. Now, you can tell there there are no openings or no handle or anything to, to grip anything on the speaker. So, I did find out though that when you take a long screwdriver and when I say a long screwdriver I really mean a long one this is about oh, I'd say six inches long yeah it's actually the Phillips screwdriver I use to release the screws alright and when you poke gently inside the screw holes at the back of the case you can actually push the case, the front of the case, out. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. So, but let's see if I can give you a better look. So, right here you have the upper left hole. Or maybe I should say the upper right hole. And in any case, you shove the long screwdriver right down into the hole where the screw normally sits and then you give it a gentle push holding the the whole outer case with your other hand and you give it a slight push and normally what you should see happen is this all right you should see the black front of, of the speaker slide out right here. All right, so you can tell it's sliding out. All right, so give me a minute to push the whole thing out and to show you what it looks like once it's out of the case. So there, there is the inside of the speaker. Okay, and if you poke with a screwdriver from the back, you can tell it comes out through the screw hole, all right? And then it pushes against the front of the speaker, which is a piece of particle board, apparently. And it has a ITT 4 ohms speaker. You can see it there. Um, I don't know this is a Deco, but I would think maybe this is a Deco 2167. So I would say... In other words, built uh, in the 21st week of 67, which makes this speaker fairly old. Um, and I'll, I'll show you, or I'll draw your attention to this, made in Western Germany, which makes this speaker uh, one that was built during the Cold War. Uh, when the Iron Curtain was still uh, upheld between the West and the Soviet Union. Uh, so actually, this is a little bit of history, really. So, in any case, this is the uh, mid-tone and low-tone speaker. And this here is the tweeter. All right. And uh, I don't know, it 
doesn't say ah there it's a four and a half ohm tweeter which has been glued on the front panel or I, I should say inside the recess of the front panel it's four and a half ohm and it's connected to the woofer via a capacitor let's try to see what sort of capacitors this is okay I would read this as a 2.2 microfarad I would guess yeah 2.2 microfarad uh, 100 volt uh, capacitor kind of doubt it's polarized but it might be polarized so yeah but in any case this uh, it is the original capacitor but it will probably need a replacing as well and it's this sort of filtering is really super basic filtering all right I took out the back insulation which is a sort of a fiber material yeah, which was packed at the back of the speaker and the very first thing I notice is that the cable the loudspeaker cable has been glued inside the case and I would guess with a kind of well probably a hot glue white hot glue and uh, I unsoldered the speaker from the main wire all right here's another tip for you so if you want to release a, a paper sticker or a paper well a label which has been glued onto a surface and you want to preserve it um, of like we obviously want to do on this case just take some regular cleaning petrol okay like this okay and uh, a, a small brush like this dip it into the petrol and then saturate the label with petrol like this all right just saturate it with petrol like that and then give it a minute all right we're a minute later oh uh, maybe two minutes later and uh, the petrol has saturated uh, the label throughout now dip your brush into the petrol once again and saturate the edge where you want to release the label first okay so when you feel that the label is starting to release of its own accord tug on it but really gently you know you don't want to tear it up obviously so and as you tear it loose brush underneath with the petrol saturated brush and pull on it again and brush again all right and pull on it again brush again don't be the impatient all right so give it give the petrol a few seconds at least to work all right so now we pull We're nearly there Right. 
There you go. All right. Now, let's apply a little bit of heat on the cable and see if we can get it to release. Time to repair the cable. All right, I pushed the cable through the uh, hole in the cabinet through which the cable originally came in, and uh, so on one end you have the connector, and on the other end you have the cable. Now, this is a, a DIN connector and the ground of a DIN connector, a speaker connector that is, is the flat end and the signal uh, of a DIN connector is the little pin you see here. So all I need to do now is to figure out uh, which end is connected to which wire. I degreased the speaker enclosure on the right, this one, with some professional degreaser. Um, and if you wonder what's in the degreaser, um, it's a very long chemical product name, which is called 5-chloro-2-methyl-4-iso- uh, Tiazolin 3 1. Alright, so that's the let's say main ingredient of this degreaser, and it works perfectly. Uh, you can see the difference between this one on the right and this one on the left. And if I take the rag with which I cleaned off the one on the right. Let me show you what the degreaser does. Alright. So, there you go. You see the spot where I use the degreaser here? Well, that's about the same effect I had over the case the other case. So I'm going to clean uh, both cases obviously with the degreaser first but then I'm uncertain what I should do and the reason is I thought I could get away with giving it a cleaning and maybe just a simple sanding but if you look at the bottom of this case You see these deep grooves into the plastic? So I'm afraid I'll have to give the case a sanding as I thought I would or I should have to and, and, and unfortunately I guess um, I will need to probably fill up these gouges in the plastic and since the filler will be of a different color than the original plastic uh, I guess I will have to repaint it. We may be in luck. So on the left you see the case I gave a new kind of treatment as the one to the right uh, only got a cleaning with the degreaser. Now it turned out that the top layer of the case was actually 
a very yellowed kind of paint, let's say. And um, I managed to rub it all off, off the case, with some pure acetone and some uh, non-fibrous cloth. This kind of cloth uh, does not uh, leave off little fibers when you wipe, and that's very important. Yeah, so don't use any rags that leave little uh, pieces of, of fibers, uh, you know, like a cotton wad or something like that. That's really bad. You need to use some sort of synthetic cloth like this. All right, this is throwaway cloth, so one use only, one time use only. And I used very clean, very pure acetone to wipe off the case. Now it's still not perfect, um, it might need another quick wipe with a, a, a fresh cloth and a little bit of acetone, but uh, aside from that and perhaps the edges, um, it looks pretty clean. Now, there is a difference. Um, the plastic, of course, is, is completely smooth and is white. I mean, snow white. Okay, uh, But it lost its luster, so it, it doesn't gleam as much anymore as uh, fresh plastic would. Um, which, uh, you know, basically which is okay. I mean, it doesn't need to sparkle for me, but yeah, it, it does deserve a little bit more cleaning, but I think if the gouges are not too deep into the plastic, I might actually leave it as it is. So just give it a good thorough cleaning and, and perhaps with a little bit of light sanding, sand out the deepest gouges and that's it. All right, the final models of chokes that I ordered uh, came in today. And um, I have four chokes, all right? Um, now, these chokes are rated respectively for 10 amp and 5 amp, which is more than enough for my purpose. Uh, since I'm going to build these uh, two-way sound filters or speaker filters into speakers that are meant to be used not at, at a wattage no higher than say 25 watts which is perfect if of course you're going to build a crossover filter for a speaker which is meant to play like 150 watts then uh, the, this choke might do it, uh, however, um, this one most likely won't. Because remember, uh, a 150 watt amplifier uh, outputs quite a bit of current and voltage. So yeah, uh, you'll have to use much bigger spools than these, okay? Um, basically, I tweaked what I got, so uh, these come like double spools or double chokes on one uh, toroidal ferrite core, uh, but I just unmounted one of them, yeah, and I was left with this. You can still tweak the inductance a little bit by pulling the windings apart a bit. Uh, but basically, you know, it's where I want it to be. So let's say around uh, 1.10 milli Henry. Yeah. So, and yeah, this is varnished copper wire. All right. And uh, the ferrite core is encapsulated in, I don't know, some sort of plastic or so. Anyway, these will do. Uh, so, my next job is to mount the parts onto a little PCB 
and that mount the PCB uh, which will then contain a crossover filter uh, into one of the speakers. Alright, one filter for one speaker is finished. Okay, so just as a reminder, what I built was a two-way crossover speaker filter. Alright. Okay, so there it is. It's rather small, compact. And the components that will, let's say, or that might radiate heat are on the outside of the print board, mainly. Uh, but since I'm not going to use this with very high output power, uh, I kind of doubt that the, any of these parts will heat up very much. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, this is going to be built in into 25 watt speakers, okay, so I don't expect this filter to run hot. Obviously, if you're going to use much more output power, then you should space these components uh, apart uh, more to allow convection to cool them down, okay. So anyway, uh, I'm pumping in 800 hertz right now at 0.4 volts into the filter and yeah, these are the leads of my signal generator okay so this is the input signal and I'm monitoring the output of both the woofer channel which is uh, right here and the tweeter output right there on my scope and this is what I'm getting right now. All right. Uh, obviously, down here you see the output for the woofer. Up here you see the output for the tweeter. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to slowly ramp up the frequency I pump in to the filter, and I'm going to tell you at uh, how many kilohertz we are okay so right now what you're seeing is 800 Hertz so if I drop a bit let's say to 400 Hertz why well, you can see the, uh, the low uh, tone so for the woofer goes almost off the chart okay so let's go to 1500 kilohertz There you go. This is 1,500 hertz. Let's go to 3 kilohertz. This is 3 kilohertz. 4. 5. 6 kilohertz. Notice the, that the output, the tweeter output, starts to kick in, okay? So you're beginning to see some signal meant for the tweeter to bleed in into the output signal of the combined output signal, you, you might say, of my filter. Okay, so the, the low tone, the 6 kilohertz, is still bleeding through, through the woofer, but now the output for the tweeter starts to activate. So let's go to 7 kilohertz. That's 7, 8. This is 10 kilohertz. And then notice at around 12 kilohertz. Both signals have equal amplitude. 
So, and that illustrates the term crossover filter. Okay, so at a certain frequency, um, the tweeter and the woofer output will have the same amplitude. Okay, so uh, which means that you're crossing over mainly from the woofer to the tweeter output of the filter. So let's raise the frequency a bit more. This is six, 16 kilohertz. All right. So now you can clearly see the uh, amplitude of the tweeter output exceeds far by far the output to the woofer. All right which is normal. You don't want to send high frequency to the woofer, you want to send it to the tweeter. So let's raise the uh, frequency two more times. This is 18 kilohertz. This is 20 kilohertz need to synchronize on, on the upper channel now. So at 20 kilohertz the output for the woofer is almost non-existent. Okay, rem don't, uh, don't forget we're now at about 100 millivolt per division. Alright, and this is oh, I would say 10 millivolts really where the signal for the tweeter is at about 110 millivolts. Okay, so there's a ratio of 10 to 1 really between both outputs. So there you go. Uh, you see the crossover filter in action. So what I need to do now is build the filter in into the speaker.
the speakers, the tweeter and the woofer to my uh, two-way uh, speaker filter. Yeah. And uh, now I need to mount the filter uh, somewhere where it doesn't bother the speakers and not too far from where the cable is going to enter the cabinet of the speaker and uh, it's entering somewhere in the middle here and around about this height here so the cable will go through uh, the case so actually from the back so it will go through the case and then enter here and then hook up here all right so I'm going to mount the filter on little standoffs and with wood screws so something like this all right and uh, and that way it will be mounted securely to the front panel the only thing then I need to do uh, uh, or the only two things I need to do then is to hook up the uh, the input wire to the filter and um, with a little bit of hot glue glue down uh, the uh, uh, low pass filter coil so this assembly here you know because obviously we don't want anything to rattle inside the speaker while it's playing because that would be uh, really annoying okay so anything that is a bit loose uh, I'll use some hot glue to glue it to the PCB so that it won't rattle in a closed enclosure speaker adding a little wadding in the shape of uh, some synthetic fiber like this on the inside of the speaker enclosure um, helps to improve the general characteristics of the speaker itself now you shouldn't overdo this I mean just a simple piece of wadding like I'm putting in right now uh, really is more than sufficient to increase the uh, general characteristics I mean sound characteristics of the speaker now um, as you can tell I'm not over stuffing the speaker all right so let's say about a third of the speaker is being stuffed now with the wadding and not much more than that um, don't expect any miracles from this stuffing uh, but it might improve the general sound quality of the speaker um, this of course is only valid for a closed enclosure speaker I mean aside from a tiny little opening at the back for the cable uh, the speaker housing or the, the speaker cabinet doesn't have any opening except the one in front of the speakers okay so uh, you shouldn't use wadding in my opinion or at least not very much so in uh, open case speakers you know there are speakers with openings at the back uh, for those with those special reflex chambers built into the speaker um, in my opinion wadding in those won't do a lot of good um, but then again a lot depends on how the speaker and specifically the speaker housing is constructed and what type of filter you're going to use in combination 
with the type of the speakers. Building speakers, good speakers, is an art, I noticed. Um, it takes quite a lot of engineering knowledge to make perfect speakers. No wonder uh, sometimes people spend a, a real fortune on speakers to get the best possible sound. Anyway, I'm going to close the speaker up and I'm going to do the same thing I'm doing right now for the other speaker and then we're going to give both of them a little test run. Alright, and here it is. One of the speakers completely finished. Front to back. Let's put it to the test, shall we? Alright, I connected my smartphone via a stereo 3.5mm uh, connector, you see here, an earphone jack really, um, via some Kinch uh, connectors to a DIN 5-pin adapter, okay, and I'm going to connect that to the appropriate connector on the back side, and I'm going to choose for the phono input, you see there, and there you go, uh, yeah, unfortunately European equipment often uses DIN connectors instead of uh, jacks like uh, which is more standard in American uh, devices uh, so now I am using the phono input which means that it's very it's a very sensitive input and it's very easy to overdrive that input so you have to make sure that if you do so you put the volume of your uh, phone uh, as low as possible. Let me show you. Okay. So there you see it's, it's practically complete down. Yeah. So about there is more than enough. Have a listen. Yeah, if you overdrive the input, uh, you will get distortion.
ago. Um, I used the brown uh, tuner amplifier for this little demo uh, for my lower restored um, speakers and uh, yeah I'm, I'm quite satisfied with the result uh, which means of course that uh, well uh, at least now I can use my rebuilt speakers for proper tests when I'll uh, restore and repair amplifiers next all right so I hope you enjoyed the restoration of a pair of Loewe B20 vintage speakers from the late 60s, early 70s. Thanks for watching.